All too often, kids in our community struggle to maintain the most basic need, stable housing. On any given night in the Twin Cities, as many as 2,500 kids are couch hopping or going with no shelter at all. Greater Twin Cities United Way believes it's time to create a future where every child has a safe place to call home. Join us in the fight to end youth homelessness in the Twin Cities at gtcuw.org. If you're like me, you're in the middle class looking for secure investments. You want stable, non-fluctuating returns. You want passive income that's manageable come tax season. My 401k and my retirement don't give me the returns I'm looking for. I want to get into commercial real estate. I'll be honest with you. But I'm not an accredited investor. In enters CRE2U.com, CRE2U.com, with tenant and common real estate deeds. Think fractional ownership of long-term, single-tenant, triple-net lease properties with corporate guarantees. Go to CRE2U.com, your gateway to commercial real estate. Let's welcome in former BYU great, my team captain, uh, a football guru, a coach as well, uh, John Beck. What's up, John? How you doing? Hey, what's going on, Ben? What's up, Jake? Great having you on. I don't know if there's an individual that I get more excited to have on our show than than uh, John Beck. And I think I get hit up all the time, John. After your interviews, I get DMs and emails. Uh, they love your insights, so we really appreciate your time, and we know that that is definitely precious uh, with, with family time and other things that you're doing. So thank you so much. John, first off, um, was it a surprise to you to hear the news that Ty had been relieved of his offensive coordinating duties last week? Well, I think the surprise was the fact that it's Ty Detmer, right? And he's BYU's Heisman Trophy winner. He's the guy that for years people have been – clamoring for to come back if we could ever get Ty to come back that would be so great that was a surprise to me well you know what wasn't the surprise though was you know everything in football is results oriented like that's how it is that's how it is at the professional level that's how it is at the collegiate level you know if the people aren't getting the results that they want to have that are above the coaches they get rid of coaches and uh you know the last two seasons they didn't go at all offensively, like I think everybody would have liked. You know, last season did a little bit better, but part of that was due to the fact that we had two NFL caliber guys, you know, at the helm, one at quarterback, one at running back, and they helped in a lot of situations. But then this last year, you know, when you have a season that is just seems like nothing's going right, you're struggling to get yards, you're struggling to get points, these are the types of things that happen. And I think the hooks are getting quicker and quicker and quicker in both the collegiate and professional levels, when you see if people aren't producing, they make changes. Yeah, indeed. So um, it, it it's something, though, I wish we weren't in a position or we weren't, we weren't forced into having to discuss this um, or having to put Ty in a situation that um, I, I've had some people tell me that, that Ty was almost set up for failure because he didn't have the resources and Kalani didn't have the resources to hire proven assistant coaches around him to help buoy him when BYU's offense was struggling when there were injuries and when uh, ultimately there was maybe a lack of talent uh, what say you is that uh, is that a valid excuse when you're underperforming especially at the bottom of the barrel in the FBS well I'm, I'm just going to step outside of BYU and go to other colleges and even at the professional levels what happens is when an offensive coordinator comes in usually they bring people with them the people that they have with them they bring because of the experience that they have running that system. Take a look at what Bronco did when he went to the University of Virginia. The majority of the spots were filled with BYU people that had been in those systems doing it, gaining experience themselves as coaches, becoming better coaches at coaching that particular system. When you have those things happening, the way that the athletes develop is much quicker. The way that you can talk and communicate with them you have so much experience doing it, you can do the right thing the first time those guys hear you. Now I'm going to jump back into BYU the way that it's been for a long time at BYU, <clears throat> dating back to when you know when we were all playing, when Jake and I were freshmen out on the field. It wasn't a staff that was filled with people that had been under a coordinator. There was a coordinator trying to teach the staff what to do, and then that staff gaining experience themselves and learning on the go as the players are also learning on the go. That makes it difficult. You look at the same thing happened when Robert came in. Robert was the only person from Texas Tech, and he was just the offensive line coach. He wasn't working with the quarterbacks. He wasn't working with the wideouts, running backs. 
he was working with strictly the line on the run game and blocking schemes and all of a sudden becomes a play caller and has to fill spots around him, and those guys have to learn the offense. So as I was learning the offense, so was Brandon. Then Brandon becomes the coordinator, and Brandon is doing basically the same thing. Let me teach you what we're going to run, not bring people with him. And unfortunately with Ty, it was kind of the same situation. BYU is a difficult place, I think, to get coaches in the assistant coach roles because there's not many coordinators that leave other schools and come and bring guys with them to BYU. BYU is like this destination spot for people that would get there, and they fit the mold, they fit the requirements, and they want to stay there. So when you bring in an offensive coordinator from the outside, it's kind of just been lately, okay, teach everybody else what to do, and let's see if they can learn it as well as the players. And that just makes it hard. Yeah, I mean, part of that's financially, but also, and I'm not trying to blame the honor code, but, but John, you've played a lot of football, you've been around a lot of teams, and the amount of position coaches that, by their own choice, choose to live the honor code would be a really, really small pool for someone to bring in from their coaching tree, right? Coaches live, a lot of times, extreme lifestyles. Um, so let me ask you this question, John, and not really talking about names, but I feel like we really have two pools to pull from as far as bringing in an offensive coordinator. Which one would you say is the ideal fit or maybe the safer bet? Bringing in somebody who's a proven play caller who's at a lower level. Maybe it's JC, maybe it's um, FCS, but they are an offensive coordinator currently and they're proven play callers. Or bringing somebody who's seen a lot, done a lot at the at the FBS level and is a you know a well-traveled, experienced position coach. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you where it's kind of like you're either going for the the veteran or the way greenie that may have shown some success at some lower levels. That's hard because I just think this, the simplest way to look at it is if you bring in somebody young, you have to expect them to be green in some areas. So you have to be willing to ride the learning experiences with them. You could bring somebody else that's a more veteran type guy and you bring them in hoping for immediate results. But that more veteran guy, he's not going to be bringing in a big staff with him. He's not going to be bringing in people. like It's almost going to be like, well, we're going to go grab somebody that you know, may be out of football for the last few years, but is a guy that over the last 30 years has had a lot of experience. And you know, maybe he can fit what BYU is looking for, and maybe there's more of a win-right-now mentality if you bring in somebody like that. So I think it just comes down to not what we all want, but, you know, Kalani's probably in on it, as well as Tom Homo. What's the, what's the case going to be? Are we willing to go with a young guy that's, you know, you may say he's super anxious, he's fired up, he's willing to put in the hours that maybe the older coaches don't put, he's willing to grind on the road, he's willing to become more creative, he's going to be more up to this, or more adept, adept at this spread offense and these new run games that they're using where these dual threat quarterbacks and these RPOs, Are they going to do that or bring in a guy with more traditional stuff? I mean, it's simple, yet it's difficult because the ramifications of this decision right now on who becomes the offensive coordinator could have an impact on the football program for the next handful of years. Gosh, I feel like, yeah, you're right. BYU is a... Um, a location where you kind of have like these donors from, you know, do, uh, organ donors, like you're getting like, you know, parts here, parts there, and you're kind of building this uh, th- this entity that's created from everything else and rather than just bringing in an offensive staff. I love that, that you just pointed that out, an offensive staff that's been somewhere else and they bring everybody else in with them, a system, a curriculum. Uh, I, I think that Bronco Mendenhall cited a, a study when we were there at BYU. You can't remember if it was 05 or 06, but he discussed about uh, efficiency and success when you – when you have a uh, you know habits right that you've you've built up over time and you have a curriculum you have a system and you're executing that every single day you become familiar with that that those habits and and, and that system and all of a sudden you're you're much more efficient and successful. Um, is it is there any way possible that BYU could bring in a, uh, a, a an FCS offensive coordinator that can bring in his entire staff and and maybe find success that way, or are we going to have to take from all these different areas and then build a staff that maybe is not familiar with each other? You know, I mean, my experience at, at BYU and watching what's happened usually it's always kind of patchwork because there's just staple coaches that 
they're going to be there because they've been there. They're BYU guys. The next people that come in don't want to boot them out. You know, we've all seen those guys stay there. It's kind of your constants. And, you know, who's going to come in and say that, hey, you got to, sorry, you know, you've done a great job over the last 12 years you've been here, but it's time for you to go because this new guy is going to bring in his people. That's how it works everywhere else. Mm. But at BYU, it, it hasn't really worked like that. It's kind of always like, well, these are our guys, and we're, we're going to let them be on the next staff. And they may have even told the coordinator that came in, you know, well, hey, guess what? This guy's going to be on the staff. He's been here for so long. We want him on. You know, all of this talk reminds me of between my – Sophomore and junior years, when Coach and I got hired, I remember going to him having questions about the offense and or going to Coach Doman having questions. And Coach Doman's like, well, let's see what happens. You know, we haven't really got to that yet. We're trying to figure out what, like, what we want to do on these reads. We're trying to figure out what fits us. I remember just feeling like, crap, for the last few years, I've just been trying to get answers so that I can learn these offensive things faster so I don't have to learn everything on the fly or on game day. Like so many of my learning experiences had to happen on game day because we practice against a certain look at practice and anticipate getting that so you're well prepared for that. And then you get out in the game and you get a different look that you're not totally prepared for. And then, hey, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and you're learning on the fly. And I'm like, man, I just, I'm tired of having to learn in the stadium all the time. And I, did, I had nobody to go to. That's like, you know what? I've been in this system for the last four years with Coach and I. Or, hey, I've been coaching his quarterback for the last three years. Or I've been working with these guys, and I know how it's been done. I know what this quarterback did. We did not have that. The only option I had was go to the video guys and say, what's all the tape Coach and I brought with him? I want all of it, and I can take it to my house. And I've been taking notes by myself, like, this is what it looks like. This is what I think. And I go back to Brandon, like, this is what I'm seeing from tape. And then we would kind of talk about it. And that if you bring in a guy that doesn't bring a staff with him, you're going to put our same quarterbacks in that same situation. And because of the collegiate rules now that are even way stricter, coaches don't get a lot of time in the offseason to coach the players. They just don't. So it leaves so much of it on the players. Well, how well can that guy do of coaching himself? Is he that type of a person? Is he that type of a, of a learner? Can he do it that way? Because you may have some talented guys, but maybe that's not the best way they learn. Well, what do you do then? You just – miss out on having their talent as best it can be. That's the hard part about college football. I hear this complaint always from collegiate coaches who we have worked with some of their quarterbacks in the off seasons, and they just say it's so hard right now because we barely even get to coach our guys in the off seasons. Well, and it goes a long ways to have a quarterback that's willing to take that amount of tape home. It's not a small amount. And there's a lot of other guys, offensive experienced guys that are willing to, you know, really put in some of that work on their own. And I hope that this, you know, graduating three of the best offensive linemen, graduating a few other people that, you know, whoever is in that quarterback spot is willing to put forth, the, you know, the at-home effort that John did. But those kind of – the kind of numbers that John put up just don't happen by accident. Yeah, I mean, but you, you can point to John's success – uh, later on his career, maybe due to the fact that he was just more mature and had those repetitions and had some failures, and therefore he was eventually going to succeed. But I think John, and correct me if I'm interpreting this incorrectly, but much of that success came about because finally you had a vision, finally you had a curriculum, finally you were able to institute those things within your little offensive unit of the offseason and rep it out. And, and therefore, when it when it came time for a, for games, I mean, it was second nature. The throws that you were making in 06, I mean, they, they were gorgeous. You were you were making anticipatory throws that at times were, were, were not executed in seasons past. Well, the first thing, you know, Every play I ever made was because of the people around me, like the belief that I had that I would be protected, that I could stand in the pocket, deliver the throws I wanted to make because I trust the guys up front, the types of throws because I trusted the guys that were around me. A lot of that came from, I look back and I say, you know, Coach Croton let me play through a lot of mistakes. That helped me for my junior and senior years. When we brought in a new offense, there was more struggles because, like, like I said, everybody was learning. Coach and I was learning, Brandon was learning, I was learning. It's like we went, it was like we went through this eight game kind of like figuring it out, trying to see what we got, what can we do, what can we tweak. We were changing reads all the time. That's not, that doesn't help for consistency. If you're always kind of tweaking things here and there, but then all of a sudden you find a groove. And then when you find a groove and you get to go into the off season and work that groove even more, and then you can talk to people because, like your teammates, because you have the experience. 
this is what it's going to look like.